London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Hello everybody to Talks Beyond Time and Place. My name is Philip Rettgas and my guest today is Frank Molloy, uh, also known as, uh, as the Soul City Wanderer. And uh, Frank is the author of the book Soul City Wandering. This is the book, A London Pilgrimage. Uh, he is a South London-born writer, journalist, producer, historian and writer. Uh, he has an MA in London history and is a qualified Blue Badge Guide, Westminster Guide and City of London Guide. Uh, he has lectured at various institutions, including the Museum of London and the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, and as an accredited journalist, he writes on travel and culture. Welcome, Frank. Very good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, your London book, Soul City Wandering. Uh, a guidebook, if you like, with uh, London Walks. The book is fusing history, music and poetry, uh, and it is right up my street, uh, and uh, I think of many others also. Uh, but before we talk about this great book, my first question is, uh, have you always been a London historian? Uh, well, studying London history, um, as in academically, I've been doing that for sort of uh, 15, 15 years, I guess. I did a um, master's degree in London history at Birkbeck and um, worked my way up from that. So I, I think from that moment onwards, I could say academically, yes, but I've always been interested in London history always. Yeah, yeah. And I think if one reads this and, and one researches a bit of, about you, it's you find out find out uh, quite whatever, or very quickly that you that you've always been interested in the in the in the city and in London and from from birth on basically uh yes yeah I mean I was born and bred in London um it very very uh I was educated there my school um because London is, is pretty flat and so there were hills around London and my school was one of the lucky ones so when I looked out of the classroom window when I wasn't listening to the teacher perhaps in history uh, I was looking at London and uh, it's just had a great vista of London and um you know I, I worked there in the uh, you know, when, when I was when I was a young man, I started working in London. You know, I not that long in ago. London, drank in the pubs, drop danced in the clubs. So it just, you know, it eventually it just seeps into your bones, and like anybody, it becomes it becomes part of you. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, as I said, you are a writer, producer, historian, and tour guide also. So, uh, in how far has London shaped you or shaped your career? Would it have been eventually different? Would it have turned out differently if you were somewhere else or if you had been somewhere else? Uh, well, it, it's a piece of luck, really. Um, I studied journalism uh, originally um, at college and there was um, a girl on my journalist course uh, who I knew, Isabel, and she was studying to be a tour guide. Anyway, we left college and, and we went our separate ways. And then many, many years later, it was a really extraordinary um, piece of luck, if you like, or fate. Uh, I was holidaying in Croatia, of all places, um, in, in Dubrovnik, and I was going to the town, and then uh, I was waiting for the bus to take me into town, and getting off the bus was Isabel. I hadn't seen her for, you know, 10 years. It was completely, and I said, Isabel, she said, Kevin, I said, I'm leaving. She said, no, I'm, I'm taking, she spoke French, so she was taking some French people around. I said, I just sound fantastic, you know, that, that really suit me so we went for a coffee and she told me how she got into guiding and um, this is about uh, the year 2002 something like that 
and so from then on that was my, my focus I've got to do this so it was just a really chance sort of big yeah. wide world thing and it brought me back to London and um, so that's where I went to yeah but I understand that I mean I've talked to some tour guides already and many of them were like when when they when they thought about it or when they had the opportunity they were like oh yes of course I'm going to do this I, I, lo I love the city I love walking around I love talking to people so yeah of course this is the thing being a tour guide so yeah I understand this um, very much so which tours do and did you offer up until now have you been offering um well uh as a tour guide and I and I You, you have to um, you have to offer what we call the bread and butter. So you have to know the, the basic highlight tour of London. And especially at the moment, because, you know, if the, the, the whole industry is dead, of course. But when people come back, that's going to be number one. Oh, so yeah. the specialist tours, I think, are going to just move out of, of the way for those ones. I think I'll be concentrating on that. And, you know, for families and, and highlights. Because people are coming back to London for the first time in a long time. Um, but I also do um, my favorite tours because I also do driving tours, so I do driving on the UK. So okay. I take people out to places. So my favorite tour is actually Stonehenge because I, I just love the place. You yeah, know, it's a great place. I, I never get bored. Um, <laughs> I've been hundreds of times and I never get bored. Um, what else? Um, I do walking tours. You know, I do rock and roll tours of London that's specific. Um, Jane Austen, I quite like day, taking people out for the day. Mm -hmm. um, It's quite nice, actually, because even though London's part of me, it is quite nice also to get out of London as well, it, you know, just, yeah. to, just, yeah. just as a bit of a break. So all kinds of tours. But as I say, the bread and butter is the is the highlights tours, you know, General Big Ben and, and everything yes, else. Yes, sure. But I think you're right. As soon as uh, people are allowed to go out on the streets again and, and participate in, in tours or anything, anything that's out on the streets, people will, nobody will stay inside. They will... You will have a lot of a lot of tours uh, coming coming in the future. I think so, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure people will come and go out as much as they can. Um, has there been something like uh, the strangest moment ever on a tour concerning maybe something strange that that happened on a tour? Because I often find this when I talk to other tour guides, they were like, something really strange happened during this one tour that somehow. Fit, fit the, the, the history or the story of the tour that, that one did? Yeah, I mean, you do, I get a lot of this happens. I mean, London's such an odd place. Um, right. that things can always happen. So, for example, um, on the last a tour I was doing last year, and I was doing um, a short stop on the British Navy, and I was talking about, you know, Lord Nelson and the British Navy, and I was talking about, you know, the Navy uniform, and then just on cue around the corner came you know a troop of sailors all wearing uniform and i could say yes and so you know i, I make out that you know i've all planned this of course of course um, yeah. because that's the joke <laughs> um but it's that synchronicity so that happens all the time um i can't say anything really weird and, and strange I, i'd like to say something weird happened to me at stonehenge you know i was transported back in time but it has happened. <laughs> um but um yeah but generally that kind of the unexpected and One of the things I learned on the last course I did, which was the Westminster course, was how to how to bring that in. You know, not not to be shocked and say, "Oh, wow, what an amazing thing!" You know, <laughs> bring it into the to the into yeah. the whole experience for people. Yes, yeah, but yeah, that's that's great. I mean, of of course it was planned. The the, the yes. uh, people in the uniforms, of course, the plan that they were coming along. Um, was there something like? Um, You, you, during your research and when you planned your tours, was there something like the, the most surprising fact that you've learned about London or the, the most interesting or surprising story that you've heard? Um, I, I think it comes from the heritage of London, really, that sort of thing. Um, there are things that you expect always to be in America. You know, our culture is, is, is based on this kind of America America first in, in terms of things and yeah. when you find out that London was the first neon lit city center that, that's like a big deal or London had the first subway yeah. or London had uh, it was the first financial center it's, it's it's the heritage you know of London that says actually you know it started here first it, it's a it's a city of firsts for that so yeah. um yeah I think that, that's and that surprises other people so when I say that to other people that surprises them as well so if it surprises me it will surprise them I'm sure Yes, sure. Yeah, but that's the thing. There's so many things that happen for the first time in London and, and 
it's it's basically it's not that much of a big deal until you hear about it you you, yeah. you would would say yeah uh, i don't know something happened in america for the first time as you say but then you find out no it was in london that that, uh, that was the first time that it um ever happened mm. so um as i said you wrote this wonderful book so city wandering and um the aim of your book uh, is to inspire travelers to engage as individuals with their journeys, to encourage interaction uh, with time, place, motion, and emotion. And the places that, that you go to are not hidden London, but uh, as you put it so beautifully, they have been selected because they have, because they have a strong synergy. Mm. So you basically search for places uh, with the soul or, or for London's soul in a way, as it's also in the, in the title. Um, which is a bit similar to, to what I try to do in a, in a more um, uh, superficial way, like finding the spirit of London, the, the genius loci, the spirit of place. So where did the idea come from, the idea to writing the book Soul City Wandering? Um, well, the title of the book actually comes from an old um, soul pop hit called uh, Soul City Walking, which was a, a song by Archie Bell and the Drells, goes back to the 70s. And I thought that was a nice sort of popular title because um i wanted the, the book to be for everyone you know as much as it can be you know to, to as a kind of a window yeah. into it but um also uh psychogeography and uh genius loci they're, they're kind of heavy words sometimes and so i wanted to make it as softer so um you know uh, you're wandering with meaning and you're finding, you know, the, the spirit of a place. So you're essentially searching for an urban spirit is it, the general thing. So Soul City Wandering was, that's where the title came from. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's difficult because it's not strictly psychogeography. I explained psychogeography because it's the main part of it. But, um, and what it was is I didn't find psychogeography. It found me, so to speak. I, I've been sort of doing this for, for a while. And then I felt like a bit of an oddball, really, you know, sort of going up these alleyways and looking at things and people looking at me a bit suspicious. But I, I had no idea that that was a thing. You know, I've been doing it for sort of 20 years and I had no idea, you know, that other people have been doing it. So and then suddenly this this idea of psychogeography, I heard it from other people. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit like yourself, Philip, you know, you're, you're operating along parallel lines, you know, and then suddenly you find that someone's doing exactly the same thing or, or very similar. Yeah. And then suddenly you, you realize that everyone, not everyone's doing it, but everyone's, you know, it's, it's, it's all been done before. There's nothing new under the sun. So, um, but it, it sort of felt that way around. Yeah. But with psychogeography generally, um, you know, a lot of people look at psychogeography from the 50s onwards, which is um, Guy Debord from France and, and the Situations Unit. Uh, I'm not sort of fully with that. What I want to do is kind of link psychogeography with genius loci if you like it's a bit it's a bit of a cross in this way mm -hmm. yeah and you yeah but you this i i i think you're doing this very well i think this is uh, you you really managed to to capture this and and to uh, to also get, give a, a sort of a a soft <laughs> a soft introduction to psychogeography even for people who never uh, never heard about it i don't know what it is but I, I had the same experience in a way because I was also, when I was in London, I also had, when, when I was uh, somewhere else, I like to just walk around and, and uh, kind of experience the, this, the environment, the, the, the streets, the houses, the buildings and um, trying to absorb as much as possible. And then when I found out about psychogeography, I thought, oh, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> I've, yeah. I've, I never knew until I read about it. Yeah, and that's it's like you. a eureka moment, like a yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And then and then you kind of okay, so it's basically it's okay to to sometimes walk around like like a complete lunatic, or maybe appearing like a lunatic to other people, like loony, uh, when you I don't know walk a certain place <laughs> again and again, yeah. or, or anything like that. Yeah. So yeah, of course, uh, um, not of course, but. As you say in the introduction, you have also been influenced by by the likes of Ian Sinclair and Peter Ackroyd, uh, the great London writers, the great psychogeography London writers. So, um, have you been also in? Have you also been influenced by their works uh, in a way? When you or was it just just like oh, that's psychogeography? 
this is what I'm doing. Or have you maybe read something by them and then thought, oh, this is an interesting approach? Um, well, when I was doing my degree in the history of London and uh, one of the um, um, theses that I wrote about was the, his the historiography of London. Because at that time I was doing it, there were a lot of books out about London, these sort of grand mm -hmm. narratives about London. And one of them was Peter Ackroyd's biography. That was the big one of the year 2000. Of it was course. just huge. It was a yeah. big copy book, you know, for everybody on the table, everyone got it for Christmas. But anyway, um, I felt that within the academic sphere, they were a little unfair to him. They, they kind of said that he was loose with the facts, um, Peter Ackroyd, and, and loose with, with what was going on. Yeah. And... I saw that first of all, and then I kind of reread the book. And I thought, actually, that's not very fair because he's doing something quite different. And he's looking at, you know, even things like nature, the, the history of nature in, in London. You know, no one else had ever done that before. So he was looking at legend and everything, and he was weaving it in. And so I get the kind of, I could, the, the, the scientific, you know, hmm? part of the academic thing. Yes, it's, it's probably not as accurate as, as others. But it, it, it's sort of a bit more of a flow. It, it sort of goes along with that. So um, that and that sort and that was kind of an introduction to because then I, I, re, I read more about Peter Ackroyd. Then I, I got the psychogeography link. Then of course, and I thought, oh, there's a lot of other people doing that. So one of the other guys was um, I don't know if you've seen this one. This is um, this is called Man's London mm -hmm. back from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And again, it's very similar. He was doing something before Ackroyd. So no one's really original. You, you, you'll go back and you'll go back and you'll go back. Um, and the other big influence on me was actually nothing to do with London. It was actually to do with Dublin. And that was, uh, this is my favourite book, by the way. And it's, um, I don't know if you can see that there. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll just focus. It's James Joyce Ulysses anyway. Uh, it's about 100 years old now as it was published. But essentially, it's a psychogeographic -geogra novel. You right. know, it, it's a guy walking around Dublin and he's looking at things in a different way, sensing it in place. And yeah, uh, I, and I worked on this. I read this book for years and I thought that links into it as well. It's fantastic. So all these bits and pieces were, were linking in. And then very, very recently, I'm, I'm talking in the last sort of few months, um, I got into uh, a French philosopher called um, Deleuze, mm -hmm. who talks about um, essentially what, what he, he talks about is that turning the whole of um, philosophy upside down. So Deleuze was a, a French philosopher, died very, very recently in the last sort of decade or so. But he talks about um, one of his main concepts is rhizomes. So it's the idea of roots. So if you look at something in London, for example, there are roots of it. There's literature, there's history, there are other things. So if you look at one place, um, you know, and you're looking for that spirit of that place, you'll find it in those those rhizomes, the history that, you know, yes. could be music or food, could be anything, could be pubs, you know, there, there are connections everywhere. Yeah. So I think Ackroyd was the one that sort of links me into the psychogeography thing. Um, but Ulysses, you know, it, it's just such a great novel to just to enjoy from that perspective. And then I'm bringing the philosophy thing into it now. So, but again, it's something I've been thinking along for a long time. So it's, it's like, um, I haven't discovered it, it's discovered me, that's how I feel, you know. Yes, yes, but that, I think that's the thing. And I, I think you're, you are right um, by saying that, that um, James, James Joyce also wrote basically a, a psychogeographic psycho psycho novel. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, you can read it that way. I, I definitely see that um, too. And yes, as you say, in the... Um, you you also mentioned in the introduction basically you you present the five branches of, of psychogeography and you, uh, you also write that you're not really attracted to the model of of the so um which which branch do you feel mostly attracted uh, to or is it your own is your own model a mixture a mixture of dif different branches basically well uh with Debor, it's the fact that, um, as, as much as I can gather, it's it's uh, it's a group drift thing, and th th those are the main sort of this idea of the drift or the derive, um, but in a group, and I I think that can lead to cross purposes. I think mm -hmm. that can lead to too many. Sometimes it can be forced or contrived, and you, you'll find your conclusions are not all mixing. So 
I find it more productive personally to, to do it as a personal thing and then share that with other people and say, this is what I've found, you know, in this place. What do you find? Do you yes. see what I mean? That's in, in that way. So, um, and also when I did the, my degree in London history, one of the, one of the main facts I found out was uh, there isn't a lot where people are concerned in London, even though London is a, you know, a place where people have come in and going for centuries, of course, there isn't a lot of residue. So people very rarely stay in the same place twice. So people don't impact as much as place. So um, that the, my degrees that helped me influence that about, more about place. So place is my primary driver. Yeah. So and, and in time, humanity and culture, they're the sort of the rhizomes, if you like, that, that given that mm -hmm. synergy. So again, and and it's, and it's trying to cro make that cross between psychogeography and and, and genius lo-fi. Yeah, yeah, yes, um, I understand this uh, very, very much and very well. Yeah. Um, so the book is basically divided into three parts, three tours, if you like, and uh, the the first part starts at Piccadilly Circus, then is uh, also in Westminster Abbey, then Westminster City of London, short detours to to Sadak and then I think up to, to Hampstead. So um, have you maybe planned this tour or was it just, a, 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 did you start in Piccadilly Circus and then see where you, and then, then, then you just drifted through London and this is what, what came out, the first one, the first tour? Um, well, in my mind, it was a drift. I had these places in my mind, um, but in practice, it, it was planned. Um, yeah. because again you know the book is I was trying to get the book as an introduction for people and so I had to strike that balance because right. stopping between a drift and a structured wall so some, something in the middle yeah um, I always think of it as the difference between um, soul music and jazz music you know jazz music is it spirals and it's free and it's you know um, loose and freestyle but soul music kind of has a structure and so it you kind of because it in the end of the day, you have to have a parameter. You just can't keep walking forever. Right. You, know, you yes. have to stop and you have, you know, night comes and, and all these things and time and distance, they, they all become parameters. So, um, there, you know, I know that the, the drift is one of the defining ethos of, of psychogeography, but I always felt that you have to have parameters, time and space, you have to be practical. So what I did is I, I thought what I do is I do a full day. So that was my, my first thing was time. Yeah. And then you'd have to say, well, how far can you go in a full day? What can you just do? So space then became the next parameter. Mm -hmm. And then I felt, well, you can you can't do too much. You know, you've got to keep people interested. There's got to be change. So and also with London, where London was concerned, I wanted to get not just Westminster or not just the city. I wanted to go south of the river, which is quite industrial. Yes. I want to go north yes. of the river, which is quite nice. Um, you know, a bit more pastoral, if you like. So I wanted to capture all those things. So, of course, the centre of London, which you can see behind me on the map, is you have the two things. You have um, the city, and which is the financial centre, and you have uh, Westminster, which is the, you know, the sort of social centre, if you like. But then North, South, East and West. So I got the 12 places I wanted to do, which really affected me. And then Piccadilly wasn't the start, so as you were asking, what I found was, well, of course, Piccadilly is the perfect place to start. It's, it's one of the great meeting places. Yeah. And it actually, when I worked it all out, I don't know, it was just kind of synchronicity. It just seemed to work. It, it just seemed to flow. So maybe there was something, uh, you know, spooky in the air there that was helping me do that. I can't <laughs> say, but it seemed to work. It just, it just worked well. Yeah. And, and I was very, very comfortable with it. Yeah. Of course, you have to say that there were a couple of places which I wanted to add in, which I, you know, you physically had to take out because there just wasn't the time. Yeah, sure. No, that's the thing. But yeah, I agree with you have to, uh, it's, it's, yeah, you have to set param parameters. So to, that, that you, uh, that you move in a certain, I have this, this amount of time or space or whatever. And this is in, in, in this parameter, I, I, I move and I, I create these, these things, these tours. So what I also noticed, especially in this first walk, or no, only basically in this first walk, is that you you often talk and come back to London's bridges, and you def deal specifically with Hungerford Bridge, uh, which has a very dark history, much, much mm. of which I, I didn't know about, especially 
most of it was was of course uh, uh, quite recent uh, history mm -hmm. So um, was that the reason that you chose uh, this particular bridge or, or the, could, it, could you have chosen any other bridge? Why, why Hungerford Bridge? Um, well, with London bridges and particularly in, in, the, in the modern world, people will know that, you know, the, there's been incidences of London bridges without going into detail, people know. So um, they've been used for some terrible things and bridges, I don't know what it is that that collects people that yeah. where dark things happen. Um, I don't know why that is, but I was very interested in that. What what was the what was the pull of a bridge that was attracting people? It's a little bit like um, a, a railway station. You know, always will attract itinerant people. So there'll be a different drama, a different um, uh, dynamic there at mm -hmm. the side of railway station. And so there's something again with bridges. I think it's the crossing of the river. Maybe it's, it's the river. Yes. You know, affecting people. Um, and then what, what it was is I, I started, there was a couple of stories I picked up and I thought, well, that mentions Hungerford Bridge and this mentions Hungerford Bridge. And I was work, working and I kept this bridge kept coming out. Now, other London bridges, you know, there's been, um, you know, murders and terrible things on there, but this was more civil, yeah. uh, you know, from a civilian perspective. And it just seemed to attract that. It wasn't sort of, um, they weren't sort of political or anything like that. They were very civilian. And the other thing about Hungerford Bridge, it, it's there is a railway bridge in, in, in the middle, but actually Hungerford Bridge is a pedestrian bridge. It's not the traffic bridge. Yes. I thought that was quite interesting as well, why it was a sort of this dark place where things can happen. So I don't know why I don't know why Hungerford Bridge does this, but the more I went into it, the more it was. And in fact, since I read the book, I read a couple of other incidents about it and I thought, oh, I wish I'd, I'd have known it at the time. I could put them in, but uh, it, it is what it is. In the next edition, you can, can yes. see stories <laughs> in, the, in the next edition. But yeah, uh, and I think, yeah, there, there's something about the bridges and, and maybe it's it's the, uh, it's the because of the river, because of the water, but, you know, the, the bridges are, are very important, especially in London's history and for the people there. And I, I mean, I include myself. I'm, I'm never really, I never really arrive in London until at least I'm at the, um, I see the Thames or I'm at the Thames and I walk over one of the bridges that that's made, yeah, it draws people to them. Um, you also in, uh, at each station of, in the book, you also include a poem of, of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you like to read one now or in the end, when would you like to do it? Or maybe you can say which one, I'm, I'm open for everything. Okay, so um, the one I'm really into at the moment is uh, something that is one of our tree. It's about a tree in uh, the city of London. And um, it, the re I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, it's only a short poem, but um, the reason I'm really into this tree um, is that uh, it stands right, it stands on its own and there's, there's no other trees around it and it's uh, all these uh, massive buildings, you, you know, these insurance and banks, you know, the tree is 80 foot tall but these huge buildings dwarf it, so it stands, it stands in the shadows of other giants, if you like. Yes. Um, it's in the city of London and if you know that when I, when I mentioned the city of London, I'm, I'm in the, the financial centre which is to the east, and so, uh, you know, it has a very different vibe. So th what, that's one of the main things about London is to understand that Westminster, there's, there's two cities, Westminster City, right. Westminster and the City of London. Yeah. And Westminster is the social area and the City of London is the financial area. And, and that helps you to understand London because once you've got those two ideas, the, the power and the money, if you like, and then you think, well, what would run in between that? And then you find out that well it will be the lawyers and the journalists and then you realize why fleet street is where it is and and why the temple is where it is where the right. lawyers train so yeah. london starts to make sense when you when you see these, these dynamics otherwise it just looks like chaos if you look at the map behind me you think my god this is chaos but it, it does make sense but you have to get into it so you're basically you're going down a labyrinth with london and you're finding these strands and you're pulling them together and you're finding your way out you know like um, uh, coming out you know using the spiders spiders web yeah so the tree one was particularly to me because it was in city and uh the tree itself was a london plane tree now the, it's a tree named after london it's, it's quite an amazing thing and the story is um 
many years ago, 300 years ago, there was, uh, there was a American sycamore and an Asian sycamore. And as people started to travel, they started, um, you know, uh, working with plants. And so they created a hybrid about 300 years ago. So this tree is actually a hybrid between two trees from completely separate parts of the, of the world. They've never come together before. And it created this special tree, which actually, uh, the way it grows is the bark of the tree, um, it, it breathes through the, the pores. And so when they get clogged with soot from the traffic, it falls off. And so it has this lovely speckled look. And then the leaves of the tree have these little hairs, which they clog up, they, they, they take all the, um, the, the pollution in the spring and then all the hairs drop off and then it leaves these beautiful glossy leaves. And of course, because they're this special sort of glossiness, it allows them to eat up the carbon dioxide and produce the oxygen. So everyone's breathing. So this tree does so much. <laughs> and then the other thing was, is directly underneath the tree, uh, if you went down into the roots, the rhizomes, if you like, you would find history. So you could go back and you would find that there was a Roman fort. You could go back and find a Bronze Age axe, which they found there. And in fact, the further they dug down, they found 10,000 years ago, there was a wolf buried yeah. under there one time, they found a wolf skull. So you have this, this history deep down underneath the roots. And then up above you, you have these, this modern world, this insurance. And then exactly where the tree is, the other thing is, is there was, there's three shops underneath the tree. And they're the oldest shops in London. And they date back to about the 1600s. And the fact is, is that the, you're, uh, there's um, a kind of protective law that you cannot build another story on top of these shops. And that protects the tree. And yeah. at the same time, the tree is covering the shops. So it has a symbiotic relationship. So that was the idea behind the tree. So if I read the, the poem, it's only a short poem. And uh, it's called, um, it's called the last of the Mohicans. So the idea is, is this is a, a tree that has survived. Okay, yeah. so, that's, so that's where the idea is from. So I shall read it to you. Please. A tree, a visible living tree, intertwining the Occident and Orient by accident, rootless cosmopolitan, shackled by its locks, soaring 80 feet, yet it's hidden in the shadows, an interloping road amid the steel and concrete blocks, surviving by regenerative bark exfoliation, resilient chirpy cockney as native as can be, cradling the songbirds that sing of joy and pain, an old romantic guru of ancient reverie. Confronting the pollution of stupendous roars of traffic, rebel eco-warrior, unraveling the vapors, protecting local commerce throughout its lone existence, a refugee and migrant sheltering its neighbors, raking its rhizomes through the ravages of time, relic of our history the tree does not forget, spreading out its limbs on a city center corner, a rugged Jesse emblem, an old cross surrogate. Jeremiah Obadiah Hannah Kanna, Uncle Bill, remembered by the reaper of decaying fallen stone. I hope and pray that rough winds won't shake its resistance. Against the odds, this real life superhero holds its own. So that's the poem. I should just also explain just something else about it. You will appreciate this, the literary aspects of where this place is because um, in the past, before the tree was planted, living there was John Keats, um, uh, Milton, John Donne, uh, Wordsworth wrote a poem about the corner of this tree, um, Shakespeare set a scene there, Jane Austen set a scene there, Chaucer, you know, there's this almost this vortex of, of literary stuff. Yes. You wouldn't expect in the, in the heart of this kind of very modern financial um, structure yeah and the also thing is the other the last funny thing is is um there is a graveyard buried there which is where you get the jeremiah obadiah these are the, the gravestones up underneath it um but it's also opposite a church which is um bow bells or, or bow church in london and for those who, who know the sort of the, the london history to be a true londoner you have to be born within the sound of bow bells right or Cockney. yes and i don't think and because this tree is born because it's physically you know planted you couldn't get closer. I mean, it's the biggest cockney going. So it's, right. a, nice, it's a nice story. So, so the tree is, a, is a, a true Londoner, a really true Londoner. I think you say that also maybe in the book or maybe I, I, I heard that in an interview. But yeah, 
it's it's right. We should also uh, mention the location. It's on Wood Street, right? It's the, Wood Street, the yes. Okay. It's easy name to remember, the Wood Street. Uh, right, Wood Street. yes. Yeah. So thank you. Great poem. Uh, it's also in the book, of course, for those who want to re-read re it. Uh, when did you start writing poetry in general? Um, about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I've looked at the stuff I wrote 20 years ago and I, <laughs> what was I thinking then? But some of it stuck. Some of it, I thought this, there's something in this one. And one of the things is that I, with with the book soul city wandering i i wanted to add another layer mm -hmm. because e even though i could say yes there's history there's literature there's geography okay fine but that's still very flat i'm only using other people's i'm only standing on the shoulders of giants if you like i'm only using what's already there so i wanted to put my own layer on it that was very very important to me to say now you have this other layer whether you like it or not that's up to you but I'm putting this 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 layer on my, my own personal layer, so that that makes my connection. So I guess I've been writing for poetry for 20 years. A lot of it is not connected to obviously London, so it you know it didn't have a place there. So I, I used the poems. Some of them came; they were already written, um, and I, I worked them in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, but I think I I understand uh, that you want to basically put your own layer or your own your own thing in there also and not just uh, use the the ideas and stories and and poems and whatever of, of people that already uh, wrote something or said something about that what i find interesting is that uh, you could visit all these places on, on this tour and, and basically deal with completely or also with, like westminster abbey with with completely different people and, and stories so uh, it's it's quite interesting you could, could go to a certain place and read it the way you did with these authors, poets, musicians, but you could also read it probably completely different if you knew different stories or different people <laughs> that were at this place. I think this is very interesting. So was there a, a particular reason why you chose the, I don't know, the, the authors, the stories that you tell at these places? Was there something like, I'm going to say this, 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 or did you just look at the, at the places and say, I'm going to, going to explain everything that happened there? Or did you select uh, maybe a bit? Yeah, no, I mean, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You, you, I mean, um, I'm sure, Philip, you yourself could go to the exact same place and then just find a completely different history and complete literature with a different literary links, for example, or different music. But what perhaps in, that you like, that you would find interesting. And again, that's the point of the book. I, this was is what moves me. It, it could only move me. I, I can't make it, you know, work for everyone. But what I want to, is for other people to do is see how it can work for me. And that, again, that's going back to the, the idea of with psychogeography, working on a personal level, level and then sharing it with everyone else saying, this is what I found. Maybe you can go to the same place and, and, and find the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because you, there's a, there are places, one of the things I did is, is I was looking, you know, whether you can find something everywhere, you know, or, or are places just dead and there's nothing there. So one of the sort of uh, practical things I did in the book was I chose a very sort of nondescript place in South London, a suburb that no one would blink at twice. And I, mean, yeah. I worked on that. So and that was very important. So history or, or psychogeography is where you find it. You can find it anywhere. And yeah. it's depth. And yeah, some people would just look at it and they wouldn't look twice. But I'm saying you can find this here. You can find it in your own place where you were born in that town. If you look deep enough, you will find the connections. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I, um, I'm, I have one one question about this, but we should put that in at the end because this this is something that I've talked about with other authors. But I'll come back to that in in the end. I just have to keep that in mind. Um, you also your work also includes uh, Saint Foster's Church, which which I didn't know has also a, a spire that was. I think it was t thought to be designed also by by Nicholas Hawksmore, and I was, you know, I, I like like this Hawksmore churches, the buildings, and also a bit of this theory about the, maybe there's some symbolism behind it. But I just al also like his buildings. So um, I mean, and, and the churches are of course also very important for London and for London's landscape mm -hmm. and the history. So is there a reason why you 
pick this particular church or was it just completely um, yeah again uh with the practical idea of the book and taking people to places along this stretch i particularly took took places which have many many layers or, or i felt they had many many layers so for example hungerford bridge i could find all these sort of connections so i say you know these are ones if this is has a thick kind of synergy very very thick um but as i say you can find that anywhere if you find you know if you find that interesting but i wanted to find one church which was kind of on the route it wouldn't take you too far out but mm. also had these uh connections and so Foster's is a very strange one it's sort of around this back street you don't see it and then you link in and um when i was i'll tell you one of the things about the church when i was um studying to become a guide i was told by somebody else oh this is the agatha christie church they call it the agatha christie church okay so agatha christie the great um writer of, of um, mm -hmm. detective novels in the 20s and 30s great and then i've i actually found out i said no there's the connection to agatha christie is not right i think someone was trying to make out that agatha christie went to this church this is where she worshipped and she didn't but it was in the finding out what what was the agatha christie connection that i found everything out else out and i found out that actually it was her husband her second husband who was an archaeologist um, who, who visited this church because the guy who ran the church, the sort of the, the, the vicar, was really into archaeology and he was into some of the other things. And then that was my window. That's what, what opened me up into St. Foster's. And then I just, everything, again, the rhizomes just come out from there. And it's yeah. just, you know, I'm sure any other church, I could pick any other church and I could, I could do that. But that one just, su just suited. Yeah. And also the, the poem that I'd already written which was about you know a, a, start, a man and a, and a boy in a church um shall i read that one as well would that be okay do you think yes sure um it's a very quick one it's quite you know it's a funny one but essentially it's about um a, a man who has his uh, young son and um they go and visit one of these churches in london the great thing about london is in normal times most of these churches are open so you can just wander in and, and they're always empty you know they're quiet that's right so you, you know it's just a lovely place to to um sort of walk around so you go into these churches and you know there's all the connections with them wren and, and uh hawksmoor of course um so this is a poem about uh two people who visit a church and it's called foster father so the idea is it's in foster's church and this is a foster father who's taking his foster son into the church bloody hell it's so quiet it's bloody quiet in here Yes, son, it's very quiet. You really shouldn't swear. After all, this is a place where people come to pray. A CH blank blank CH. What's missing, by the way? What are you doing? Put that back. That's our Lord's thorny crown. What's your name, Bardolf? Heavens, if it isn't nailed down. Pardon me for looking. It ain't like when in Rome. Oh, father, please forgive me. Who's Bardolph when at home? Never mind, forget it. Come on, honey bunch. I think that it stopped raining. Let's go and get some lunch. Ah, I got it. Clever. Dad, you are on form today. Here, that pulpit is impressive. Well, I think anyway. Gibbons, I should imagine, judging by the carving. Cool. You know your stuff, don't you? Come on, let's go. I'm starving. So, uh, great. That's a quite a Benjamin type poem. If you know yeah. the words of Benjamin, it's a, it's a very kind of similar sort of thing. Um, but I had that poem already, and then I just fixed it into the Foster thing, and it just yeah. worked. It worked. And even the Gibbons, the Gibbons pulpit. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it really does. Yeah, it, it works. So, um, yeah, we basically covered the the first tour and this the second tour uh i found this very interesting is uh it's about the british museum and it's all just in the british museum and i really like this because uh when I, when it's when it's possible i will do the walk i will go to the british museum <laughs> with, with your book as my guide and and just visit exactly these these sites and then reread what everybody said where did, did this idea come from to say i'm going to go into a museum uh, and and do it 
you know, psychogeography in a museum? Well, uh, obviously, the, what I was trying to do was, was give you different examples in the book of, of different psychogeographic journeys. You didn't just have to go across London, you could do something within a place. And there's a practical thing there, because what happens if it's raining and you want to do something, so at least you're inside. Um, so the, the museum one, the reason I focused on the British Museum, of course, it's very famous, but the fact is, is that in the centre of the museum used to be the British Library. Yes. And so for years, if anybody who, anybody who was anyone in the world of literature went to the British Museum, I mean, you, you did all your research there and there was this huge kind of round room and all the, you know, the desks were there and you got all your books that you wanted. So all the great literary figures, I mean, if you think of Charles Dickens, um, Bram Stoker, yeah. what I like to think is they were all in there at various times, some, maybe some of them at the same time, sitting in a yeah. next to each other, you know, doing this work. And so, and that is in the, right in the centre of the museum. What I mean is the, the museum is, is built around it. So what they would have done is they, would, they clearly would have been influenced by what was around them. You go to the museum, you're waiting for your ticket to get in because if it was timed, it would become very busy maybe go for a wander around the museum and, and find some influence. And so Keats would have done this. Um, he wrote uh, Ode to a Grecian Urn, but he would have been influenced by the museum. Yeats was very um, much influenced by, because he would wait and then he would go and have a look at a, a statue or a Roman, you know, um, sculpture and then come back and write about that. So the British Museum then became this uh, strange place where you have these works of art, and then these uh, these great writers would come in and then write about the works of art, creating works of art themselves. It, yes. And that's another kind of, it's another rhizome, if you see, it sort of comes on. Right. Yeah. So uh, that, that was, I think that more than any other place, British Museum is that. You, I mean, I could go to the Victoria and Albert Museum, but it doesn't have the literary connections. Right. So, um, yeah. Yes. That's yeah. Busy work. yeah. And you also, I think this is very interesting, you also deal with the question, if words have more durability than, than objects. So what is your opinion about that? Words and objects. Um, hmm. I, I mean, it's a tough one. And, and that's the, the question I ask in the book because, uh, you okay. know, it, it's all about, if you ask me, you know, physically, physically it's objects because we know we can prove, science can prove that the oldest thing is a, a stone age Axe from Kenya three million years ago. Okay, we know that, and that, and we know that perhaps from a depiction point of view, cave paintings thirty thousand years. So definitely objects from a physical point of view. But if I was to ask you, for example, Philip, um, what do you remember from childhood? You might say, oh, a soft toy or something like that. I'd say, okay, so that's a physical thing. Mm -hmm. But what what has a lasting effect on your mind? So real durability would possibly be a book yes yeah so it's a really tough one to, to, to answer yeah. so when you talk about durability you're thinking yeah from a human point of view but from a personal point of view i think words have a bigger impact on us yes. um, than objects but it's a it's a tough one and, yeah. and that's the question i ask it's a conundrum yes oh, yeah i know uh, it, it, i think it's it's a really tough one but i i, I tend to i tend to agree that probably words have a deeper impact but it's it's very very tough uh, have you ever been to the reading room i, I would love to go in there but I've, i never had the, the possibility yes um i used to be i had a ticket um back in back in the day um and i loved it i was working um because i used to be a journalist so i used to do a lot of research of course and i used to go in there and um it was just the joy of going in there and sitting at the same desk and thinking oh, i wonder if uh, lenin sat here or i wonder if uh, yeah not lenin i can't marx rather um, I wonder if um, uh, Charles Dickens sat here. You know, you get that. I mean, talk about um, place and, uh, and power. And you're thinking, oh, that was it. these great writers were sitting in the same place. Yeah. Um, so I was always actually very, very upset when they moved the library out because mm -hmm. they moved the library. They, they just got too many books and they moved the library to um, near St Pancras. And the centre just became this kind of nondescript exhibition centre. I, I really didn't like it. Mm. Um, in fact, you know, I, I felt what they could have done is maybe perhaps kept the literature section inside there. Yes. And have all the science maybe up, up in the other place. 
and then people could still go in and use it because yeah. to me now it's just a dead place. I, I do have exhibitions there now and again, but it's a lost place now. And, and, it, and considering the impact it had on culture, and it's not just English literature, you know, Gandhi was there. Um, all these great thinkers from all the, over the world came to the British Library when they spent their time in London because it was this, it, it, it was it was full of, full of all these books. It was one of the great libraries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you're right. But I still, still, I would love to go to go visit it. I would love to go in there and uh, just oh. just be there once. <laughs> they took. I mean, they took all the desks away, and uh, yeah. I don't know what they did with them. I, you know, if they were they were selling them, I wouldn't mind buying one. But, so. <laughs> Who knows, but yeah. Um, that was the second tour in the book. And the third one is probably the one that's, well, you also say that there were, were people who never heard about uh, psychogeography, that's the one that maybe they can, it, it's the, the, the softer, <laughs> one of the, the softer one, or you, the one you can uh, relate to most because it's all about um, Soho pubs and the, the history of, the, of Swinging London basically, and all the musicians and the bands. Uh, and in, in Soho that uh, became popular and, and played at all these venues that most of, of which don't exist anymore. But then you connected to the pubs in the area. Um, I think you, you devised the walk, the, the walk for the National Portrait Gallery's 2009 exhibition from the Beatles to Bowie. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a bit about the, the exhibition and your involvement in it? Yes, yeah, so the National Portrait Gallery in London is obviously images and paintings and, and photographs of people. And they did this special one, it was really, really popular about 12 years ago. And um, from the Beatles to Bowie. So you're generally looking at a sort of period of time between uh, 1963 and 1967. Very short gap. Yes. So it's the beginning of the Beatles to the very beginning of Bowie. And most of the pictures are black and white. So they're wonderful things. And a lot of them were not just images you know posed images they were just images of these people in, in normal day-to-day -day life situations you know just in a party or something like that just enjoying themselves and um so the way that i got involved in the project originally was that they wanted a walk i i suggested that you know a lot of these photographs you could still go and see these actual places where the photograph was taken so that added a different dimension so I worked on a walk very, you know, that so people could go to see the exhibition in the morning. And again, you have to be practical. You have to think about time and maybe get some lunch. And then in the afternoon, they could go on a walk, you know, two hour walk. It's a lovely day. You know, it makes a very, very, very nice sort of enjoyable day. Um, and then because I worked on this, they said if I could do some lectures. So I did a series of lectures at the, at the lecture there to there, um, which was the, the third strand to it. So you have the lectures, the exhibition, and then you had the um, the walk. And then, of course, you go buy, buy the book at the shop or whatever, you know, you have all the extras. So uh, it, it, it was a kind of multi-dimensional thing. So the lecture thing was what I did was I looked at the pictures and looked at what they were doing, you know, what places them in, in time. You know, that it could be a picture of David Bowie drinking a certain beer that is no longer available or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, just little things like this. Or haircuts. Um, I was very, very interested in, in particular in this period of time between, it seems to be between January 1964 and July 1964. And what happens is you see the pictures before then, you see the Beatles are in suits. The Rolling Stones are in suits. They have very, very sensible haircuts. Yeah. And you can see that the, the, the marketing people are saying, this is the way you should look and this is how you should do. And then suddenly this amazing color thing just explodes. It's just really strange. And then you see, you see, um, you know, flares and, and open collars and uh, people are wearing what they like and the hair is just going everywhere, you know, the long hair. And it's, it seems to start just in 1964. Okay, it takes a couple of years to become swinging, swinging London. But by the time of 1966, you know, London is has become this cultural center again. Right. But from a very strange kind of uh, austere beginning, you know, because I, you know, in the 50s we had the war and, you know, everything there was no money about. So people were very, very, um, uh, let's say, sensible and conservative in their dress. And then suddenly in 64, it just, I don't know what it is by that period, but something happens in time and it just explodes. Yeah. So, and I was very interested in that, in, 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 in when you see that in the photographs and so you see the sort of, before and after sort of thing of the Beatles, for example. Yes. In six months, they just, they just changed. 
yes and um I, I, yeah, but but I it's I think it's interesting just what what you just said that um, m maybe it was all this I don't know this this energy that suddenly exploded that came out with, to, and turned London into the the world's capital of of culture mm. I think as you also say uh, in the book and I think this is very interesting because it was quite actually a short period it, it's basically sixty three to sixty seven something like that and then. In, in America, they, they had the hippie movement and things like that. But it basically started in London, the, the whole movement, if you like, from yes. the 60s and everything that, that came with it. I think this is interesting that, yeah, again, it, London was, was, the, it was the place where it happened for the first time. Uh, yeah, and there was so much creative energy there. And I like that yes. you in include the songs so you can... You can make yes. a playlist. Yes, so again, and that's another dimension. So now you're bringing in sound. You, you, so you walk from place to place and you can listen to that particular song. Of course, for, for reasons of copyright, I couldn't, you know, do that um, or do the lyrics. But I could say, like, if, if you want, you can, you can tune into iTunes or wherever you get your music source from. And then you can listen to this and, and then you can get an idea um, of what it is out. Because London was a very odd place in the fact that, yes, you there was music, of course, or rock and roll music, and there was Memphis, and there was all these places, but uh, but there, you know, there was Detroit, and there were, you know, you had the soul, and mm. nothing was focused. It was all over the place, and in Germany as well, you know. And you think of um, in Hamburg, you have uh, the Beatles are playing in Hamburg. Right. You have these pockets, but uh, it's almost like it needs to to come together somewhere. You need a certain sort of thing, and then so it seems to all come into London. All these sort of influences. Yeah. Yeah. like a like a big band and then it explode you know yeah. and uh so but it's it's bringing all this stuff from all these influences from everywhere yes i think i'm also going to do this walk but if i visit every pub and have a pint in every pub it's going to take quite a while <laughs> and i'm but going look, to be... try, try i always say try a half in every pub uh, yeah because okay. yeah. um, 12 pints is pretty heavy but you don't have to have a drink in there you can just stop outside yeah. and you don't have sure. to go in um, but yeah. one of the things is um, where I did that particular one is because even though I'm introducing people to the idea of psychotropy, what I'm also saying is you're doing this already, but some of you don't realise you're doing it. Right, yeah. And for years there's been pub, pub calls around London on certain themes, and one of them has been Monopoly. So you know the game of Monopoly, mm -hmm. and what you can do is you can go around, uh, around the board to, to the closest pub, or you can do the circle line, which is... a uh, subway system you pop up at every station you go to the nearest pub and pop down again yeah so this is sort of uh, you know yeah. a, a, a tour beneath uh, and you can make up your own themes you can do your own thing um so i just basically put the the, the rock and roll thing or a kind of pub crawl um but i i meant i definitely had to have pubs that were still there yeah it wasn't it wasn't a ghost walk it had to be you can still go there you can still visit these places you can have a beer next to Jimi hendrix where he stood or something like that. <laughs> yeah yeah but um yeah and there we are again i mean as, as you say people are they're, they're always doing it psychogeography in a way maybe without yeah. even knowing it and uh, now we, we come back to the question that i had in mind earlier which is uh, and, and which i also discussed or talked about with with some of my other guests uh, so if if one did not know the history of a certain uh, area uh, would one still feel something there or would one be com completely ignorant of, of the soul, of the spirit of place? W what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's tough. I, I don't necessarily think people would feel the soul. I, I, you know, you, you can bring someone to a place and say, what do you feel? And I don't feel anything. There might be a seed in there somewhere. Yeah. But I think a place does have to kind of move you personally and it has to be place and and you yeah as i say that that was why i picked that place down in south london because it was personal to me is where i grew up and then i started looking into it and i thought you know there is stuff here there is history here and i did on my own history on it um and uh, how it grew as a suburb and uh, very very interesting okay it's not going to be interesting to everybody but a few like-minded people but i could do a walk there now in this very nondescript suburb and mm -hmm. I, could, I reckon I could make it fairly interesting for people. Yeah. Um, but it was the layers, it was the, it was the different layers within that thing. But you could do that to any, 
I think you could do it to any place. But whether a person would just, if you just dropped a person in a place and said, is there soul here? Whether they would feel that, I don't, I'm not quite sure they would. I thought you have to, you have to search for your soul. Right, yeah. But soul City Wandering. <laughs> right, Soul City Wandering. But I think this is maybe, you, you, you feel drawn to certain places and sometimes you don't even know why. And then when you find out what happened there or maybe about the history of the place or whatever, or mm. some stories concerning uh, the place, then you think, oh, okay, yeah, it, it, it's somehow, it, it's natural that I felt drawn to this place. So I think you, you do have a kind of, uh, you do feel a kind of connection to mm. what interests you. And this is, yeah, this is Soul City Wandering. Uh, so yeah, it's a great book. I can recommend it, Salt City Wandering, a London pilgrimage by Frank Malloy. Uh, what is your next project? Do you have any next projects? Um, well, of course, the problem is it's, 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 it's so difficult at the moment to do anything to get out. Right, yeah. Uh, so, um, and, and there's no tours going on, there's nothing going on in, in terms of tours. So, but there are advantages. Um, so you can, if you want, if you like writing, you can sit down and you can write. <laughs> yeah, been a better time. So what I'm working on at the moment is um, another place in London, which has a very, very strong um, synergy, and it's the German embassy in London just before World War II. Um, and I'm writing about the, what was going on there in the 30s, all the spies there and everything. Oh, yeah. Very, very interesting. And lots of, lots of um, things that impacted on history happened in this one place. And it's still there today. It's now, strangely enough, it's the Royal Society um, there is, is based there. Um, I unfortunately I can't visit it at the moment because it's closed, and so I can't do my research. Yeah. What can you do? So I can only sort of do work on the outside bits, and then when it's ready to be open, I've, I've, I've spoken to the chap there, and he said he's going to, you know, when when things are right, I should be able to, to sort of visit, and then I can finish it off. So that's but that's the project I'm working. Very very interested. I've got very much into um, the spies. Of London, I mean, it's, yeah. I know it's a subject, you know, the Russian spies and all this kind of thing. It's, it's a very, it's a dark subject, but it's a very interesting subject. Yeah. Oh yes, it is. It is definitely. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That would be a very interesting read, also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Frank, I always finish my talks with two or three, or maybe four, final questions that I ask everybody of every every one of my guests. Uh, the first one is. What is your favorite place in London? Or do you have a favorite place in London? Um, yes, I do. Uh, my favorite place is Southwark, which is the area, um, Southwark now means a huge borough, but I'm talking about the area, the district just around London Bridge, south of, south of the river. Um, and the reason I, I picked that is because when I started work, when I was a young man, I don't know, back in 1984, I think I started my first job in Southwark. And Southwark then was a very industrial area, very industrial, so not so much now. Uh, heavy on the printing, many other industries there, lots of smells, you know, they made biscuits and soap and jam. And, you know, it was the, it was the industrial heart of London. In fact, it's the South Works, that's where you get the name from, Southwark. So uh, I started working there in, the, in, in, uh, in printing warehouses. Um, and I used to walk around and the pubs there, they were quite, um, uh, how can I put it? Today, today these are nice places to visit because Southwark has become more gentrified. There are yeah. visitors there, and, and people have had to clean up their act. But back in the day, those were quite spicy places to visit, you know, mm. and uh, very, very interesting. Lots of interesting characters. Yeah. Very poor part of London as well. Um, so I, I, I started work there, and I, 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 when I started doing my touring, that's where I started doing my first walks. And I really got into that place. And I've watched Southwark change over the, I don't know, the 40 years. I've watched it become this, what is now really, yeah. a, it's nice. There's still those edges. That's the nice thing. There's still those edges down there that you can see. This is what it used to be like. But uh, now it's a much more safer place to go for a, a walk. I wouldn't have done it for 40 years. But, yeah. But uh, I think this is... I don't know if how you are. Is, is the change a good thing or a bad thing? But because I think it's just natural for a city or especially for London that things change, areas change, and some some corners they stay the same. But in after all, it's it's all about change. So I think it's it's 
quite interesting to to witness this change of of, a, of an, an area yeah i mean I, I don't know how i feel about it i really don't know how i feel i i yearn for the old place but i know what it was like mm -hmm. i know it was a tough place and i know that you know i i wouldn't have taken complete people down there they would have thought you know this, this is a madman what's he going to do down here with you know <laughs> just wouldn't do that um and you do lose those hard edges um but it's nice to be able to relate that to people say and we have photography i can say this is what it was like i can show people pictures of old pubs it's mm -hmm. sad when the old pubs close down i, I must admit oh, that yeah. really does you know i, I remember saying oh, i remember this used to be a pub and and now it's just a nondescript building you know i'm not i don't mind so much when they turn a pub they keep the building and they turn it into something else you know at least the building is still there but i don't know how i feel about it and things always change it never stops changing so right um yeah I yeah. don't know how I feel about it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a big. You always have a bit of a of a mixed feeling because you mm. you uh, you identify maybe everybody identifies with a certain place or when you grow up mm. there or when you live there for a certain time, and when this changes, it's always a bit a bit sad because because of the of your own experiences and and what you yeah what you did there and when, what what the, you experienced there. But yeah, mm. so it's a bit difficult sometimes. So my, or basically my last question is always, but you, it's your cho uh, choice to answer that or to, if you can answer it, maybe you can't. Uh, can you name three Londoners that you would have a din you would have dinner or a drink with from throughout history? Oh, throughout history. I was going to say anyone at the moment. I haven't been, I haven't been <laughs> yes. I'd love to go out for a drink with someone. It doesn't matter yeah. who it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, throughout history. Uh, you can also choose live people that are, that are still alive it's no okay matter. no matter uh yes i think and uh, so am I, am I talking people that are proper londoners or people who came in or people lived in london people like, that are con connected to london many people choose choose shakespeare or dickens and they yeah. both uh, they're not born yeah. Like, so yeah i mean if i could go back in history i think the one place i would go back to would be um the 1940s i would love to see that the, the the churchill thing i'd oh, probably yeah. like to, to, to meet him um very very interesting character and i do a lot of work on churchill he's a very very uh, up and down character very very interesting yeah um shakespeare of course would, would be very interesting but um uh yeah um there was a fellow called john stowe um he wrote a book in the 1600s let me see if i can find it uh, <laughs> is john stowe uh, yeah there it is just a sec Right yes. there, John Stowe, Survey, Survey of London, mm -hmm. and he was like the psychotographer. I don't know, right. the late the Shakespearean times. So if you said, oh, "Would you rather meet him or Shakespeare?" I think I might rather meet this guy because he just walked every street and he describes it in so much detail. So I mean, um, yes, of course, you, 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 you say that. As a, from a London perspective, I think I'd like to meet him. From a literature perspective, of course, Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, yeah. But more, you know, if it was people that were living, uh, um, I would I would say there there is a, a, a radio DJ called Robert Elms who does uh, Radio London, and he does this show every day, pretty much every day. I think every day on Sunday, and it's like three hours long, and he just talks about London, and he just gets to people, he just gets people to come in on his show and say, uh, okay, somebody's mentioned this um, this statue of a dog in. in in high barney does anyone know anything about it and then you get all these people coming in right and they yeah. say, oh, i found out about this dog and again you get these rhizomes you get these stories and, and you find, oh, that's interesting and then someone else says actually there's another statue identical in westminster why is this happening and he just does this and it just it just flows and it's really really wonderful thing um and but the thing is with robert elms he's quite cute because he has to play this sort of well i don't know anything you know you have to tell me <laughs> You'll, you know, otherwise no one would be fucked yeah. up if, if he was a know all you know but he does know it he really yeah. does know his london and he's written books on it and um you know he, he has that feeling for london um so i'd like to meet him um there's another chap who used to be in the pop music industry his name is suds and he used to be in a pop group called madness mm -hmm. which was a very london-based band and he's since gone to have a quite an interesting career in looking at different parts of london so um again 
he would be somebody I'd like to talk to. And then I think uh, quite this one's quite from the outside, Twiggy. Yeah. Twiggy was a model in the um, 1960s. She's very much a face of, of swing in London. She was the famous face. Right. And she's very, you know, whenever I've seen her, she seems so down to earth. But if that was one person, I'd say, no, tell me the truth about what was happening in, between the Rolling Stones and, the, you know, and I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. the Beatles in there. You know, did you see anything happening? She would be the one to know because she looks like she was, she covered that whole period and she went right into the 70s as well. And right. she's still going, you know, today yes. and, and still, still looks great. And um, yeah, so if I yep. could have a, you know, a coffee or, or and, you, know, you know, she she'd be the other person, I think, from, from today. People that are still living today, Londoners today, yeah. And, and she's, She's probably also someone who she she um, she remembers. She's not someone who says, "Oh, I don't remember this." She's probably someone who yes. says, "Oh, I could yeah. tell you a lot of stories." But yeah, yeah, yeah that she would, would be, be a, she would be a rich um, resource for me. I'll, I'll be there when my notebook writes all these stories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yes, that would be uh, that would be interesting to talk to her and, and listen to all these stories. So uh, thank you very much, Frank for uh, this conversation. This is Frank's inspiring book, Soul City Wandering. Uh, Frank uses history, music and poetry to help readers discover, rediscover the capital, its streets, its structures and its soul. And uh, of course, I'm going to put a link to the book and to your website into the description. Uh, so thank you for joining me. It was great to have you uh, here. So yeah, thank you very much, Frank Molloy. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Thank you.